Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Barman. I'm going to talk about web automation by demonstration. And this is work done with Sarah Chasen, Ross Bodick, my advisor, and Sameet Bolwani. So what I'm going to describe today is um, a record and replay framework for the browser. Before going into how we implemented this tool, I'm going to talk about why it's important. And so the tool is really targeted toward end users, so people who don't know how to program. And if you're an end user on the web, you're basically limited to the functionality provided to you by the website. So if you want to do something outside of that functionality, you kind of have two choices. Either you know, do it manually, so this may be repetitive or tedious, or hire a programmer to do it for you. So we see record and replay as a way to bridge this functionality to extend uh, what a website can do for the end user. And this is a little vague, so I'm going to talk about two specific examples or applications which use record and replay to extend the functionality of a website. So the first one is a web scraper for structured data on a website. And I'm going to show you a scenario inspired by a, a report done by the website ProPublica. So ProPublica does investigative journalism, and they did this story about physician payments or pharmaceutical company payments to doctors. And this data is accessible on the internet, but the form of the data isn't really specified. So each pharmaceutical company has their own web page. And for this one, the data is simply an HTML table, which is spread across multiple pages. But for other websites, uh, the data contains links, and each link can open up a hop-up. And you know, every, every website has different format. And we talked to a reporter from ProPublica, and what they did was they created a scraper for every page. And basically, all this responsibility fell upon the one programmer they had on staff. But wouldn't it be nice if each reporter could scrape the data they wanted simply by demonstration? So they could scrape off or demonstrate how to scrape off one row of the data, and a tool could automatically use that demonstration to scrape off all the data. And we built such a tool, which we'll demo at the end of the talk. The next example application I want to show is a price tracker. So you as a consumer want to buy a product, but you want to wait until it hits a certain price. So you can record how to scrape off the price off a website, put in the value you want, and then have yourself notified when it hits that value. So I'm going to show, go through a demo or a, a walkthrough of a, how to scrape the price on Amazon.com. And I'll use this example later and through the talk as our running example. So you want to buy this camera, but you actually want to buy the silver version. So you navigate to the web page, and then you decide the silver version. So you're going to hover over the silver button. The picture changes, but the price hasn't been updated yet. You click the button, the page grays out, and a few seconds later, the new price information appears. Now this is a pretty simple, interac pretty simple interaction, but it can fail many ways for the replayer. So if I'm in a replayer, I could fail if I, just, if I can't find the silver button to click. So if I click some other version, then I'm going to scrape the price information for some other version which is wrong. It's going to give me, the user, a bad, a bad price. But another more subtle failure is if I don't wait too long. If you remember, that page got grayed out. And while the page was grayed out, it has the price of the old version, the black version of the camera. So as a replayer, if I don't understand these subtleties in the page, and I, I fail. And we saw in a lot of previous record and replay tools, it wasn't able to handle these situations. So I'm going to talk about the overview of how our replay works and how it's able to handle these, and how it can actually create a robust replay from a recording. So the, the, the way our tool works, it observes a user demonstrating with a web page. And this is a normal interaction. The user doesn't have any idea they're being recorded. Our tool hooks into the browser. And it observes the DOM events that happen on the page, along with HTTP requests. Using this information, it creates a recording, which it can then be fed back to the replayer, or we call our tool Ringer, to mimic what the user does on the web page. But additionally, these recordings can be fed into other applications and modified. Say, instead of the user typing you know, string foo, now we want to type the string bar. So that we will give an API for that, which then can be fed to Ringer and then uh, replayed on the browser. But for today's talk, I'm mostly going to talk about how we can create these faithful recordings, or these robust recordings. So one might ask, you know, isn't this a solved problem? The internet is ubiquitous. You know, we really want to help end users. Isn't there work on this already? And there has been. But I'm going to try to you know, 
say that it doesn't quite fit what we want. So the first class of web automation tools that have existed already are, you know, programming languages for web automation. So this includes like libraries such as Selenium and more user-friendly languages like Sakuli or Chickenfoot. But at the end of the day, these are libraries in a, in a, pro in a programming languages and out of the scope for the majority of end users who do don't know, know how to program or don't have the time to learn these languages. Another class of tools are mashups. So a popular one is if this then that, and allows you to connect two websites together. So here's a quick mashup that'll allow an end user to back up their contacts to Google Spreadsheet. Now the issue here though, is if you don't have a hook into a website, you can't really create these mashups. So if you're on say your company's website or a smaller website that doesn't have these hooks, you're still kind of left in the dust. And the final class of web automation tools are programming by demonstration tools. So this is Coscraft, Coscriptor, Selenium IDE, and they have a similar goal to what we do, is that they observe a user demonstrating or interacting with a web page and create a script. But a lot of these scripts are fragile. And what do I mean by fragile? Well, they'll observe this interaction, create a script, but when you replay it, it won't do exactly what you want. It won't really mimic the user. And what we found is a lot of these tools were built you know, a few years ago, before the web really became interactive. So it handles really well static pages, simple static pages. But today's web is interactive. They have Ajax requests, they have a lot of JavaScript going on, custom widgets that make it hard to do replay. And so these tools aren't able to handle those. And we do an, uh, an experiment against Coscriptor, which is a tool that allows you to make a demonstration and create a human readable script. And we show that our tool performs better than that. And I'll talk about that later. So now that I've gotten, kind of gone over what the problem is and its past work, I'm going to go over our approach. And it's a pretty simple approach. We're going to observe the user demonstration and create a recording, uh, which is just a sequence of statements. And each statement will take the form, wait until trigger, then dispatch action on element. So the three constructs are actions, which are simply what the replayer should do on the page, elements, on what GUI component should the action occur upon, and triggers, when should the action occur. But the difficulty in constructing such a, uh, such a script is that we're given limited information. We can only observe the user interacting with the page, and from this, we have to synthesize such a, such a, com um, such a statement. And, but there may be ambiguity on the page. So, you know, the goal for, our is to, uh, goal for us was to create abstractions for each of these constructs that can be inferred by the from the user's demonstration. So let's go into each construct and I'll kind of show what um, abstraction we chose. So for actions, we wanted something that could mimic what the user does on the page. And we looked at past approaches, and what they did was try to create like semantic high-level actions. So for Coscriptor, a user, say, typed in a text box, and it would say, create the action type Sony, for example. But we found this failed in many situations. So if you go on Amazon and use the text box, when, the, when, you're, when you're typing it, it'll create this autocomplete menu with all these choices. But if you programmatically just insert the text Sony into there, those choices won't appear. And that's because when a user types into the text box, it's creating all these DOM events. Key down, key press, text input, and so on and so forth. And the web page is listening for these DOM events. So if we don't replay and mimic all these DOM events faithfully, we're not gonna get, be able to create the same um, interaction with the web page that we, did, that we saw during the recording. So what we use is we mimic these DOM events. We record, during, the, during the recording, we put all DOM events that happen on the page, and during the replay, we mimic them. And in that way, we're able to handle these custom widgets that are pretty frequent on today's modern web pages. The next construct are elements. So the challenge here is the user interacts with some element on the page during the recording, and we need to find a corresponding element on the replay time page. Now this may be obvious to a person, but what if the page gets redesigned? Say there's some sort of A-B testing, or the page gets obfuscated, or generally you can even like resize the page. So this is an Amazon. If you resize the page slightly, this text goes away. So we need to find some way to identify these elements across multiple page executions. And what past approaches tried 
was finding a few features of the element. So for example, it used the text surrounding the element or possibly the path from the root element of the DOM tree to the element itself using a simple XPath expression. But these broke when the page got redesigned. So instead, the way our approach works, it stores features of the, of the element during the record time hun and hundreds of features. It stores the position, the text, the color, uh, relation to other nodes on the page, and it uses each feature to do a similarity metric. So during the replay time, we rank all the nodes on the page to find one that is most similar to our node. And in that way, we're able to robustly handle slight changes on the page. And our final task is to find an abstraction for triggers. So if we look at Amazon, what happens is when the user clicks the button, it sends a request over to the server to fetch the new price information. And if the replayer doesn't wait for this information to come back, it'll actually record the wrong price. And another funny thing is if you, if you hit, hit to, uh, add to cart during this time too, it'll add the previous version. So as a human, you understand the graying out of the page is a visual cue that you should stop your execution and that you need to wait till the page uh, reappears again. But as a replayer, this is hard to understand. And in, in general, there may be many such you know, visual changes that are occurring on the page, and it's hard to figure out which ones are important or not. So instead, we use HTTP requests as a proxy for these visual cues. So our intuition here is that you know, pages don't arbitrarily add delays. So usually the delays are because it needs to do some sort of server request, so if we can identify server requests, then we can use those as a trigger to understand when the page is ready for the next action. And so for Amazon, we can specify, we can find such a server request and use parameters of the, of the URL to say we should wait. So now we've gone over each of the abstractions. I want to go over the whole process, and then I'll go over the evaluation. So during the record phase, we simply listen to DOM events and, and the record attributes of the elements. So here, when the user clicks the button, we store a mouse down, focus, mouse up, and click event. And this creates a very simple script. Now, if you look at this, the script is naive. It knows what to do on what elements, but it doesn't know when to do it. So we need to run, uh, run another step. And this is what we're going to do, the trigger inference. So we're going to actually replay this naive script using the timings we observed during the user's demonstration. Now these timings you know, will mostly work, but sometimes they won't. So we might get some passing executions and some failing executions. And we're only going to look at the passing ones. And then we're going to correlate requests across all passing executions. And then we're going to ask a simple question of, before each action, which request do we always see? And if we observe that a request always happens before an action, we're going to put a causal dependency between that request and that action and embed that into the script, just like we did here. So we got over the approach, but we wanted to ask, you know, how well does this work? And I guess the only way to really you know, test it is to work on live web pages and see whether we're able to record and replay them. We conducted four experiments, kind of testing our script versus other tools and versus itself. So we did an end-to-end -end test versus CoScriptor on a set of benchmarks. We used the same set of benchmarks to do a longitudinal study. So we replayed the same script over a period of 24 days. And then we tested our node addressing algorithm and our trigger inference algorithm in isolation. I won't have time to talk about those today, but they're in the paper if you're interested. So for our set of benchmarks, we chose 34 websites uh, that are across Alexa, ranked pages. And for each website, we picked an interaction that was kind of crucial to the website, kind of, you know, that what we thought would a normal user would do on it. And then for also to, to automate the experiments, we chose a correctness criteria. So an example benchmark was on southwest.com. We wanted to book a flight from Sa San Francisco to Houston. And so our correctness criteria is on the last page, the text San Francisco, California, Hobby Houston should exist. And here's the list of all the benchmarks. I didn't want you to read them all, but the idea here is that they span a wide range of uh, types of websites, from e-commerce to social media to more informative websites. So we didn't just try to pick a complete single genre. So for our end-to-end -end test versus CoScriptor, our, ring, uh, our tool, Ringer, passed 25 of the 34 benchmarks, while CoScriptor only passed six. 
And we failed for a variety of reasons. Sometimes their node identification couldn't uh, handle the changes on the page, or the website used Flash. But I kind of wanted to show in this experiment that CoScriptor really failed uh, because it wasn't able to capture these fine, fine grained uh, actions, such as the autocomplete menu. And 21 of the websites failed because of this reason. So this really kind of motivates our choice of action abstraction. Our next experiment tested our tool across a time period. We wanted to see whether these scripts would be uh, usable for a long period of time. So out of the 34, 24 benchmarks succeeded on day one. 15 of these benchmarks succeeded the entire time, and six only uh, failed during one. Not too bad. And now, oh, so yeah, we imagine using this record and replay framework to build more expressive user applications. And now I'm going to pass it to Sarah, one of the collaborators, and she'll give you a demo of a tool we built using Ringer. So I'm going to be talking about a tool that is not actually a part of this paper, but that I've been building on top of Ringer that actually uses a Ringer script as the input. And the idea is you will use it to help non-coders scrape large data sets from the web. So the user will s demonstrate how to record the, the first row of a relational data set that they want. And then we will actually go ahead and figure out with the tool how to scrape the next 10,000 rows or whatever you may have. So let's say we want to actually scrape some Yelp reviews. We're going to do that right now. All right. So like I said, we want to get that first row. So we want to get the first restaurant and the first review for that first restaurant. So here we have some nice Amsterdam restaurants. Go ahead and actually, we're interacting with the page normally. The only thing that's changing is sometimes we can scrape. So here we're scraping some information about that first review, that first restaurant. And now we're done. OK, so what happened there was we made that Ringer script that is now being fed into the tool. The tool is figuring out how to process it. Specifically, it's figuring out where to insert loops. So what it's doing is it's actually going to this page and it's asking, are there any relations on this page for which we might want to repeat an action over and over and over? Um, and if we scroll down, we'll see that, in fact, it figured out, yeah, we probably want to do that for a list of restaurants. That's these. And then it went and looked on the restaurant page and said, OK, we probably want to do that for a list of reviews. That's these. And so now if we look up here, we can see, OK, we have a, a program looking representation of what our script is actually going to do. So. Let's go down and let it scrape that data for us. All right, so it's going to go off and do that. So what we did in this case, you know, maybe you're going to be in Amsterdam for some reason, and you want to be a good visitor, of course. So you want to find out all the things you can do in Amsterdam that you can't do at home. If you happen to be from Seattle, then you're in luck, because you're going to find out what those things are. We scraped all this data, as you just saw, for the Amsterdam site, just exactly what you're seeing happening right now. We did the same thing for Seattle. And you can see it's actually collecting all this data for us. So here we have it for the first website. We've got, let's see, that second restaurant somewhere down here. All right. So we've actually scraped all that data before. So we're going to go ahead and stop that for now and show you the results. So what we did was we looked at, see if I can maximize it. And there we go. All right. So we looked at how frequently phrases occurred in the Seattle reviews versus the Amsterdam reviews. This is too much. That's too many phrases. So let's only look at the common ones. We get down to that. All right, we're starting to see some patterns. But of course, what we're really interested in is those differences. Let's actually see what's more common in one or the other city. And so we can see, OK, it looks like Delhi is getting some more play in Seattle. Pancakes is getting a little more in Amsterdam. But of course, what we really want is what can we get in Amsterdam that we just can't get at home? So let's go down to these cases. 
And here we're getting, you know, the really cool stuff. So, okay, some of these are kind of obvious, right? Euros and Dutch food, uh, whatever. Verbalen is actually deep fried gravy, which is a local specialty, fascinating. We've got Amstel, that's a beer here. We've got rice table and the Dutch for that, which is Ristoffel, I can't pronounce it, sorry. And basically that's like a Dutch way of presenting Indonesian food. It's like a dozen different Indonesian plates. You should all get it, it's delicious. And this is like their cute little pancake. Okay, so fun stuff. Anyway, back to our summary. So just to sum up, if you walk away with one key idea at the end of this, it should be that to do correct, successful record and replay on today's highly interactive pages, what you really need to do is pick the right abstractions for your replay language. That's the real key right there. And with that, we'd love to answer your questions. <laughs>